meeting of the Orange Town Town Board for 2019. Would the clerk please call the roll? Here. Councilman Tom Diveny. Here. Councilman Dennis Troy. Present. Supervisor Chris Day. Here. Would Esther Baylor please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? You. All right, just a reminder for everyone, both at home and here, we've changed the formats for the meeting, so we will be doing first presentations. We have a couple today, one from the libraries and one from the AOH, and then we'll be doing our workshop of everything on the agenda. So we'll have um, a talk about everything that we're going to be able to vote on later. After that comes public comments, so everyone can give what they, their thoughts from the public on what we workshopped, and then we will then vote on anything we feel comfortable voting on at that point that we talked about earlier on in the meeting. So we'll be able to get everything done that we need to. If something requires more discussion in another meeting, we'll push it off. But I think most of these agenda items will probably be voted on today, barring anything surprising. So first, I want to invite our South Orange Town libraries from the, within the South Orange Town School District. They've been working on possible uh, consolidation, creating district libraries. So they wanted to talk about that a little bit. So invite representatives or whichever elected representative Vicki no not or, elected <laughs> or no, selected no, I no, should no, say no. selected how group. are you how's everyone happy new, year. happy new year thank you for having us um, we the Orangeburg um, Tapan and Palisades Library along with Blauvelt um, and Piermont uh, Library make up the uh, libraries of the South Orange Town or the Ar the South Orange Town portion of the um, of town. Um, Pearl River has its own library that's coterminous with uh, the school district and Piermont is its own special district library. Um, the libraries kind of in the middle of town are part of, I, as I understand it, what once was the Orange Town Library. Uh, and that goes back way, 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 way far. Um, over the years, the way the town board has um, uh, looked at the way we are set up. Originally, we were considered when the, so for the the Orange Town Libraries, or what we'll call the South Orange Town Libraries, the town board uh, is the uh, taxing authority on our behalf, um, and then assesses the levy on homeowners, and then based on uh, your vote, uh, that's the those are that's how we build our budget. So whatever you all decide is the right amount of money to increase our budget by every year based on what we've requested and what you feel is good for the town um, is what you have been doing for the past several years. At one point, um, the town board looked at that uh, budget request from the libraries as a whole uh, so that everybody got the same increase across the board or the same decrease or whatever that was every year. Uh, in more recent times, the law had been changed so that uh, the individual libraries would be able to request and the board would then consider each request individually so that then moving forward maybe the Blauvelt library would get one percentage of an increase whereas Orangeburg or Tepan would get something different and that again the idea was was intended to do that based on the individual library's needs. Um, in the ensuing years we've discovered that uh, library service has changed, the needs of the community have changed, um, and in lean years, the town board has, uh, in some cases, cut the library budgets or not raised them as much as we would have preferred in order for us to provide what we consider appropriate service to our, to our um, cardholders. So in the past few years, we have been discussing this concept of um, becoming a special district, which would allow for us to take our budget vote to the public, to our card cardholders specifically. So essentially similar to what um, both Piermont and Pearl River do. There are two ways to do that um, that we have been focusing on. One is the special district library, which is similar, as I said, to what Piermont uh, has um, had created through legislation. 
they are they then have the the um, their budget vote go to the the residents the card holders of of Piermont. In Pearl River, it's done through the school district. So the school district is actually the taxing authority. Um, we have, as I said, the, the libraries have been in discussion about the two options for that and what that could look like. And we understood that the town board members had some questions about what that might look like. This is an issue for you because for, in order for us to move forward, you would need to adopt a home rule resolution that allows us to move forward. Of course, in addition to that, you are the taxing authority. So we wanted to come before you this tonight. Uh, we appreciate that this has been rescheduled a few times, and we appreciate uh, your accommodating all of us. Um, just to answer whatever questions you had, um, give a little bit more information about the differences between um, the special district version of the library versus a uh, school district version of a library, cons of a library district. Thank you, thank you. So just basically, there's school district, which would be if every single one of these libraries participated. Special district is some sort of separate independent library, which could be multiple of them, which is what they're looking at, or what we have right now, where they're all being funded by us. Right now, Blauvelt is not wanting to participate in a school district, and Piermont would only participate if everyone else was in a school district, because they're already a special district library. So we're looking at Orangeburg, Pepin, Palisades being a unified system that then can either, again, directly tax or probably in that case directly go to the people because it's a we would special go, district. If a special district, then the people would vote. So the advantages in my mind, I, I support this and I think that it would be good because it would, one, make us not be responsible for determining library funding, which is really a community issue that I think it merits direct attention by people, and two, it allow you folks to share resources without us one day coming in and saying, you're the library that has to do this, and you're the library that has to do that. You can make your decisions as to how to cross-load personnel and stuff. So I, I personally think it's a good idea. I don't know if there's any questions anyone has or thoughts they might have on the subject. Gentlemen. The, the three libraries would have the same amount you needed. 5% uh, for Orangeburg, then Palisades would get 5%, and Tapan would get 5%? If the libraries were to come together and form a separate special district, yes. then those three, then a new, t a new library board would be created, and that library board would look at the structure of the budget. Um, we've talked about different scenarios for that to happen, but again, ultimately the responsibility would be um, of the members of the new board, which by the way would be elected members of that board, elected by the public, they would have the responsibility of crafting budgets and then presenting those to the public the same way you do, line by line. They'd be like departments of one entity basically. Right, and depending on how, we've, we've talked about a couple of scenarios where there would be essentially, there could be one director with, uh, with two assistant directors, one each at one of the other branches. Uh, we've talked about whether that's feasible. We talked about um, um, working out programming so that uh, there's no, there's not a lot of overlap. Uh, one library could possibly be identified as the library where you go for robotics, or one library could be identified as where you go for music one that month. Um, there has been a little bit of cons of of um, work to work together, the five libraries. If you've ever seen over the summer the Mighty Five library flyer that comes out because the library directors of the five libraries got together and said we should look at how we're programming things in the summer so that families have the opportunity to attend a program in Piermont if they want to, or they can attend a program in Bloville. I mean, all of the libraries, if you're a card holder, are open to the, to the public anyway, but for programming, it's a sort of first come based on your library district first served. See, I would support this because if you have your own district and then it goes out to the public to vote, as long as the three libraries are in agreement, I'm fine with that. And well, again, if people think I have an axe to grind against libraries. The reason I did have an axe to grind is because for 19 out of 20 years, and I've said this a lot of times, 19 out of 20 years, the four libraries got 10% per year. And the one year, I think it was 5%. That wasn't 10. But that never went out to the public, which is not the way to do things in a democracy. It's not. So what you're trying to do, I think, is a good thing. Well, thank you for that. We think so, too. 
Any other thoughts on the subject, gentlemen? Or, I mean, well, we don't have to make any decisions clear, tonight. Who's going to who's gonna be collecting the revenues? Is the school district? Is the town still going to do it? The libraries would collect through the town assessor's office still. It's my understanding because the assessor still has to collect them as property tax. Just like a fire, the fire, other The fire same way as the fire district or the ambulance district. Fire. Yeah, like yeah. Nopal all about, like all the other fire departments, basically. So the public would vote, they would present their budget, the public would vote on whether to approve that budget or not. Once it's approved, we would calculate out what that percentage is for tax bill. And all right, all right. So I, they would come off of our tax cap number, uh, the town of Warnerstown's tax cap number. We wouldn't have to fund them. Uh, and they would be their own taxing district. Well, uh, I can. I, I definitely would support this because one of the issues I always had was that. Oh, I said I could definitely support this because one of the issues, and I, we're going back six years ago when Dennis and I were talking about uh, when the budgets were a lot harder to balance and there was this huge fund balance, and the problem I always had is that there was no one from your districts voted to approve that budget or disapprove it. It, was, it came to the five members on this board. Now, if, if you guys have a budget and you want people to support it, you'll present the information and the members of that new uh, three library district, you know, you get the votes, you get it. If not, you go back to the drawing board, but at least anyone in that district will have a right to have a say in that budget, and I think it's great. Thank you. Well, yeah, I just have a question, uh, basically on procedure. So, when does the vote happen? Like, is it so? What happens basically is when the fire district has a vote, they do it in the middle of May, in the middle of the summer, and they vote for a new firehouse, and 40 people come out and they vote and they get a brand new firehouse. How does this work? Is it on it would be, day? It would be similar. We would choose, or the new, the new library district board, elected by the public would choose the election day once it comes up with its bylaws and its, its charter is written. So the only concern I have is right now we do have a, a system of checks and balances, which is the town board looks at your budget and says, hold it. You guys got a healthy fund balance here. You know, uh, we don't want to be responsible for, and, and we're, the, we're the checks and balances. Right. Because we're looking at that, and that's what our job is to do that. When you send it out to the general public, you got to make sure they're getting all that information. And if you do an off-season vote, <laughs> you usually don't get a lot of people out to them. And you can look at past history. That's I'm not making that up. There's not there's not a lot of people come out in those elections. What I will say is that that in Clarkstown, where they have the direct election of the libraries, they've seen. I know the New City libraries had some pretty high turnout elections, and they've had issues where they've had. To, boards change over because they want to tackle the expenses and stuff like that. I think it, people approach it a little different than the fire because it's a different type of expense. I mean, I mean, Pearl River does it. Pearl River, has Pearl River gets a, a decent amount of, of people out there to vote on, on, their, on their budget, uh, uh, their, their uh, library budget. Uh, but I just, I, I think that I'm not going to say that my, I have a, my opinion is more or better than the, the voters themselves that are in that district. They should have a right to vote on that budget. Instead of we having to uh, assume that we know what's best for the, the, um, the um, other people. No one said that. What, what I said was, you don't get the senior citizens coming out to vote on the fire district. They just don't. I get what you're the saying. fire guys. The very low turnout elections like that. Yeah. So I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we have a system of checks and balances where we're supposed to be the check. What, what I would suggest, I don't know if this, but they, they write the charter. Like, they, they create it, and it has to be approved. It has to be approved by so, the state. So, I mean, in, our, in my mind, I do share Paul's concerns about the random choice of election day that occurs with some of these things. If that's something you can incorporate in where you're trying to tie it into an actual existing election day, whether it's on the primary where a lot day, of voters people come might out. come out The otherwise. only issue with doing it on that I can see immediately off the top of my head is if you're talking about doing it on a school election day, that means people have to go to the school to vote and then go to a library to vote. Well, it wouldn't have to be necessarily the school. Well, you could do it on the, the primaries going to be in June now. You could do it on the day of the primary day. Same issue, you know. though, because you'd have to go to your primary polling location. Oh, because you vote at the actual library is you what you're saying. You vote actually at the actual oh, library. Oh, okay. Right. That is different, yeah. So now you're asking people to vote on the same day in two different locations, which I, I, I didn't think realize it was would at the become library. more complicated and discourage people from voting. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that type of... Vote. 
I think transparency uh, of our budget and our mission, or the transparency of the budget and the mission of the new live, the newly elected library board and library district is imperative in making sure um, that people are aware of what the new library district is doing and why, as with any governmental operation. I mean, there's always going to be voter apathy. We hope that the new library board would do its absolute utmost, utmost best to be in touch with its constituents, with its cardholders. The advantage that we have is that our cardholders come into the library to use our services. We have the opportunity to have those one-on-one, -on -one, or the library staffs have the opportunity to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people we are directly serving. So, so what about the non-cardholders? gives us... What about the residents who are going to pay the taxes who are non-cardholders? The same thing we would so do. So they have to be I, educated, I would hope that too. the new board right. would utilize every media outlet, whether it's written or social media, to inform its constituents about budget votes. One other thing I'll and say. And services provided. If this was already one big library for this area, there's less of an advantage to this in, the, in my mind. Right now we're looking at three, when you add, if, if, if you were to add Belleville and Pyramid in five small libraries in a small geographic area, the other half of town is basically served by one library. This allows them to really be interconnected so that right now if someone calls out sick in Orangeburg, they can't cross-load an employee over to, from Palisades. This is going to become one network where they're all it's one library. Be, really? It's going to turn it because it, it sounds to me like the it's intention. three individual Absolutely. libraries. It is now, but it becomes one library with, think of it as one library with three locations. One location is the Palisades library location, one location is Orangeburg, one location is uh, oh. Tepan. We so that's the advantage here. You're getting well, the ability to cross-load employees that, and that stuff. Makes a big, you know, we that each that's pay the whole auditor. Thing. Yeah. There's a whole set, there's we each pay an redundancy. auditor annually several, several thousand dollars a year right now. to make sure that our books are in order. We would save costs right there because we wouldn't have to f have three audits. We'd have one audit. I mean, so you just also, an example off the, uh, you have right. a very simple mm -hmm. thing that people don't always but realize is an expense. You're going to share The expectation is that it would become a new library district with a director, subordinate one director, for one all director three libraries? with subordinate with one staff, board where the, the director board. would yeah. be responsible through departmental, however that's arranged, um, for making sure that children's librarians are covered for all the library buildings, that circulation staff is covered for all the library buildings, the pages are managed for all of the library buildings. And they could do things like specialize a library, like this one's going to be more I, of the kids' library. I appreciate library, the efficiency the of one. joining yeah. the three libraries, yeah. and I think that's actually a good thing. Right. And I'm not, you know, no, I don't, I don't you're plan right. on that's voting right. on this tonight, Chris. No, and we're not. Yeah, this is a presentation, on. absolutely. And I, I hope it would eliminate, like, duplication of services. Too. One of the things that we're looking at, and we've asked Pattern for Progress to help us out with this, um, is to do a study of where we would find efficiencies, both financially and operationally. See, that's a good thing. That, of course, I'll throw this in. It's going to cost a little bit of money, and, you know, maybe the town board might help us out with that cost. I asked them to present maybe. the amount to us, and we'll make a call. Maybe. Once we see. If, you, if you're interested, we'd love Dennis, it. You have something? What's the timetable on this? You have to get home rule uh, through Albany? Yes. In order to do this? So that is So you're very probably true. not doing this until 2020? Yeah, probably. We're, we're a little bit far, further behind in this process. We had hoped to get a home rule resolution from you by January. That obviously is not going to work now because we're looking at this pattern for progress study because we do want to make a firm and complete and clear case to the governor's office as well as to you all about what this um, new model would look like and how it would become more efficient and save the taxpayers ultimately money. Generally speaking, the governor prefers school district libraries, not special districts. So. One other observation. But it's In the spirit of transparency, if a library had major construction, major changes that should go up to a vote to the people in that district, that hasn't happened in the past. We would have to, I believe, Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we would have to bond. Yeah. Well, that, that, by creating the district, we have the ability to do that. But all of their budgets, if they combine into one, will have to be voted on. Uh, in the past, obviously, you know, the board decided what their budgets were, and they had fund balance, and, and they were able but we, to... Yeah, they mortgage less. I'm going to call The Tap Hand Library the, I don't has a mortgage, yes. Yeah, yeah, we, don't, don't we don't have control, control the check. Actually. Yeah, we write a we check, and any, they can change what they do, we essentially. We check on any of this. Everything was a blank check going in the past. That's... Well, yeah, Dennis, I would, I would respectfully disagree that it was no, that, before, we, that it was going in Vicky, blind. We Vicky, were before your time. We were very clear about what we were... Before your time. 
We were clear about what we were presenting in our budget, though. The, the budget uh, presentations for the last five, six years have been excellent compared to what went on before that. And that, that was before my time because I looked at every line and I was part of the checks and balances. These were all very solid, but yeah, you're right. I'm going back to when the Journal News said I was a book when burner I was a, for when I was a young child. The That's fair years. enough. I, yeah. I can't speak to when I was you, a young child. You, still <laughs> you were using the library at the time. I was <laughs> actually not here. I didn't no. live here as okay, a child. Okay, so there we go. But I did use the library where I did live. But basically, what Vicky's alluding to is that the governor generally prefers school district, not special district, so they have to make a good case why this special district, because we don't have Blauvelt and Piermont participating is an advantage over the old existing system. Well, so they want to have the study and show that clearly because a lot of places say special district and they only have one location already. Yep. In this case, we're consolidating locations. So we got to make that case well, and it, well and so it gets it, passed. It's their case to make. Well, it's their case. Saying, Supposedly, yeah. he's also for consolidation and saving money. He is. That's, yes. why they, they're, that's why they're taking it slow, essentially, is to make sure that they can clear that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, He says he is. All right. All right. Any, unless there's any questions, we really appreciate you coming in. and. Uh, we will be available as we have been. Does any of the other library people yeah. want to speak? I know you were selected as the. <laughs> <laughs> no? So I would just question what the process is, and maybe Rob and I can talk about what the process is for the so home rule Dennis resolution. If it's a simple that guy from fifth grade resolution, and what the timing resolution. for that would look like, <laughs> yeah. or we can right, be yeah, in touch can, about it. We can talk about the timing. Okay. I, mean, I don't know if we want to wait for the study, but we, we can get it full. That's something that the Before session continues. So if you, for some reason, feel you can get it done in this legislative yeah, session, we can pass the home yeah. rule this legislative session. We right. passed them, I think, what, for the other, yeah, in like April, I think, last mm -hmm. time. So there's time. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Carrie, you have something? Sure. Blauvelt Library. We, I, I did not come prepared to speak and actually we didn't know exactly anything other than we were asked to be here today. So we weren't exactly, we weren't aware of the study till yesterday and some of, some of the other information. I just wanted to quickly share with the board, we did look into this. We are always in favor of um, being more resourceful, working together with the other libraries and I think we have as a group, done that very well and continued to improve. The Mighty Five that you mentioned, that was actually something that um, we kind of helped to organize and spearhead. We share resources and we look forward to continuing to do that. When we looked into this issue, our concern, our research led us to believe that in, in the long run, it might actually end up costing more because your employee model would have to change. Your employees would have to become civil service employees. And we had somebody come from RCLS. We, at your library, you graciously mm -hmm. hosted. Mm -hmm. And there were enough concerns that we thought at this time, this is not something that we felt was in the best interest of our patrons. So that was our concern. It may make sense to the other libraries, but we just did not feel that it was in the best interest um, and made sense at this time. So, but we are always looking to work with our fellow uh, libraries, and um, we just wanted to throw that out there. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. All right, thank you very much, folks from the various libraries. Um, we're going to move on to the next presentation. Slightly different topic. The Ancient Order, Order of Hibernians are presenting on the annual St. Patrick's Day Parade. I only see, I don't see everyone here, so. Okay. Just Tom Levy. I don't see Bill Young here or Jim McDonald, but no. why are they coming in so long? They know this. Yeah, Bill is the head of the committee for uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade uh, for 2019. Bill Young. Yeah. The floor is yours. All right. Uh, I want to thank the board for past uh, assistance in doing the St. Patrick's Day Parade. It's been wonderful. And basically, we're looking for the same assistance this year in crowd control, barriers, stage placement, uh, street closures, uh, stripe on Main Street, and strategic placement of port -a johns <laughs> And that's yeah. basically it. And Thank show you. Mobile. Show mobile. Oh, yeah. This uh, was all submitted in writing. Normally, they don't come in to ask us in person. They come in for a presentation after the fact, but they wanted this year to sort of formally ask. And I, we appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. So, just one thing, Tom, yeah. just for the the viewing audience, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, 
is on a Sunday. Sunday. Yes. So therefore, the New York City Parade is on March 16th, the day before. And the Pearl River Parade is always the Sunday after the New York City Parade. So this year, it turns out that's on the 17th. That's right. And that happens, I don't know, once every The real parade is on the real same Yeah, they might be same. marching a little slower. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that. <laughs> so it's March 17th in Pearl River. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving on. Now, again, we're going to go through what's on the agenda, workshop it, and then we're going to come back and do public comment. So we're just going to start flipping through our agendas here. The first resolution on the agenda will be to send uh, training at the Annual Association of Towns and then delegates to the Association of Towns. Then we have award of the bid for the RFP the engineering and design and architectural design for the community center. Does any, anyone want to talk about this at all? Are we good? This is the, we issued the RFP for the design, design of the new community center that we talked about. We received a bunch of responses and uh, we interviewed four at the town department head level and then interviewed two at the town board level. Um, the general sense of the board was that combining all the different factors after asking for some modifications to the design that, you know, that we originally were looking more for a Honda Civic and some of them came in with Cadillac, Cadillac Escalades of uh, community centers. So they redid some of their, their planning and we're gonna be getting in under $5 million build cost. And this is the cost here for the design and engineering full service so for this firm is here. Is the $5 million include this 564 seven? I don't think it did, no. No, so the total cost would be, it's approximate, so. That was a $5 million build, not counting engineering, what? I don't think. Any other costs that, w that the public should be aware of? We no. got $5 million. They told us it was included, both, both firms did this, so that the last two, when they presented, said that it included all site prep, all construction, all everything, and they could get it under five, fine, and then we can still try to needle another 100K or 200K out of there if we need to, but they said they can definitely get what we want out under five million. Uh, we had to make a couple compromises on the floors. We only have one floor plus the gym, which would be a two-story structure, but with only one floor of uh, standard rooms, that saved a lot of money. And then as far as uh, amenities for the community, what, what is still in there? So everything we wanted except for an actual exercise with gym equipment would still be in there. We have the meeting rooms, we have an auditorium, we have a, gy a gymnasium like basketball courts. It would include some sort of running track around that, which could be a hanging elevated running track. Um, get, there's office space included in that for our parks and rec, uh, all the internet connectivity you need. The only thing that we had to take out was the actual workout, like lifting weights and getting on a treadmill stuff. But we talked about it, and I think the general sense was we're not going to compete with, you know, retro fitness and vision. vision and everything anyway. We'd have to charge the same amount for that, no, and it wouldn't be a good experience anyway compared to those I places. Mean, the, there, there was still some kitchen facility, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah I sorry, mean, there was still kitchen, yeah. I forgot to mention that. I know. For the meetings, yeah. The senior, senior uh, clubs coming in. The kitchen was still in they there, have yeah. They have a kitchen. They do. Go, yeah. I mean, just, just it, you have the community center, senior center that I fully support. It has a lot of amenities. Mm. You, th we're floating the idea of redoing town hall. Some of the amenities that are be putting in the community center, the plans for this building should reflect that we've already provided certain amenities in that part. You shouldn't yes. have a duplication of the same amenities in both the rec center and and then the new town hall. I agree completely. Yeah, and absolutely. I'll, I'll just have to see what. Yeah, what no, there's what. no need. I mean, I think the 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 town hall, and I think the RFP reflects it. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jane, but the town hall is focused entirely on the operations of town government and meeting space for town board meetings and stuff. There's no shared use. There's no there's internet. No, well, there's internet. Yeah. No, for for. Is there any meeting rooms? In no, the there's no meeting rooms for the community. There's just uh, an open atrium that, you know, you can't no, stop I someone mean, from walking in and sitting down, but okay. not, not like this, I'm no. A big fan of the atrium. Well, one of the things i comment on, the, when we had the last two, uh, two presentations that came in, 
All right. You end up bringing in the heads of the departments. You had Parks and Rec. You had the uh, building department. You had the uh, legal. You had the DEME. All right. Finance. Of course, you have finance. You can put in the bill here. But the uh, and the town board. And I thought it was a very good process in terms of both the presentations. And we had, I'm sorry, the deputy supervisor was there too. But the. Uh, we had to pay him overtime for it. <laughs> <laughs> Two times double, uh, two times zero is zero. But the, uh, and then, then we had a vote at the end, and I thought it went really well yeah. as, as a group. A straw, vote. a straw vote, not a formal vote. We offered our opinions, yes. Yes. Rob correcting us for the well, legal record. Tell you, yeah. With the crew of people who are there, it's tough not to get their opinions. You know? true. Like, yeah. it, well, I think the, I want to really thank the department heads that were involved. The Dennis just rattled off. Also, IT was involved. Um, Jane especially did a lot of work on it, and Eamon with their engineering. Um, so. And that helped with creating the RFP for the town hall as well. So, and Eric, of course, sitting over there. He's hiding. He's hiding. He's hiding behind Joe. Um, if Eric wasn't there, he wouldn't have gotten an office. No, it, 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 Eric wanted to sit there and make sure he had his offices. He said, That's not what's getting cut. <laughs> so, um, anyway, it was a really well managed process, I think. On the, thank you, thanks to them, really, is where it came from. So, all right. Next is uh, we're going to be setting a public hearing regarding those code changes associated with the parking uh, to improve the access to our municipal lots that I've been working with our uh, parking enforcement on. It basically is going to encourage people who are parking in downtown Periver to park in the lots so that the spots in front of the businesses are more open. We see that, according to him, our municipal lots are extremely underutilized. You see a lot of empty spaces. One of them only commuters can use and no commuters really use it. The number of permits sold is barely any. So we're going to have a public hearing set on that. We're not doing any decisions on it. We're just setting the public hearing. And then setting a public hearing on that water course diversion permit for that property. Uh, it will have by that point cycled through all the different departments it had to get through um, for that. Then sewer sewer work, certificates of registration. Uh, release a performance bond for the Brightview Senior Living Site. They will have completed their requirements under that. Well, well they have. Just I'm going sorry. back to that water diversion, that is yes. on a, that's on Fisher. Yes. yes. Um, 60 Fisher Avenue. Yeah. There still needs. What's that? Well, just yeah, Donald, you want to come up? Yeah. On Fisher. Fisher, the water Fisher. course. We've been working with the Town of Orange, Town Highway Department. Uh, there's been problems there with, with that water course, and what but, we're going to be doing is uh, piping it. But there's got there's underlying agreements with the with the neighbor that have to be. Uh, that is correct. The neighbor we had a meeting done. with the neighbor, and we're preparing the documents. So you'll have those in time for the public well, hearing. Well, yes. I mean, I'm going to have. Uh, before I knew we were going to have the vote, I've been representing the uh, uh, McGuire's, and so I'm not going to be able to. to oh, you're going to abstain. So I'm going to have okay. to abstain, but we haven't got the underlying agreement, which will, because bottom line is, there's a, uh, th there's an easement, but uh, it's in the wrong place. It's in the wrong place. So they put the, they put the pipe on the, not on the easement. So right now, the water, the water drains into like a, an open ditch. So they want to connect to the misplaced pipe on my, my client's property, and we have to come to an agreement on, on that before any of this really can be voted on. I just want everyone to know. So, so this is just set in public In right? March. Down yeah. before March 12th? Yes, we'll, we'll have that agreement finished. All right, just yeah. wanted to put that out. All right, yeah, because we're sending for March 12th. It's got a ways off. Um, good. Okay. All right, good. Thank you, Don. All right, moving back on to performance bond. Got that. Uh, the Sanitation Commission authorized a rate increase for the uh, garbage collection, so we're going to be voting to certify and approve that, number eight. <coughs> then there's some uh, stuff with the lease agreements for our uh, cell phone towers, uh, their lease space on our tower. Th is this anything unique and special, uh, Teresa? Uh, no. no. Okay. No. It's all technical stuff. Like. Yeah. Okay. There's no, it's no like 
there's nothing of substance being changed in the agreements. It's all, you know, legalese edits. New equipment added, many new lease, got it. And then authorize solicit bids for recycling collection. We're going to do an RFP for recycling. We've been without a contract for recycling since, I guess, since I was in the, going into the U.S. Army, I think it is. So um, we need to get that formalized. Uh, otherwise, if they get mad at us, they can just stop taking the recycling. Um, then we're going to have the MOU for the Rockland County Intelligence Center with assignment of a police officer or two, which has been done every year um, for many years now. And then also for the uh, counterterrorism training and law enforcement over time related to, uh, this is reimbursement for that stuff here. Um, then attendance at DARE training for one of our POs. Uh, already left yesterday, so hopefully we, uh, we support that. We weren't voting last week, so. Uh, resolution to approve a caretaker agreement for Nike Park. It's the, ge the gentleman that lives at, um, at the actual park and takes care of it, lives in the structure there. Um, accepted donation memorial bench. Approved cured in place pipelining in Pearl River for the highway department. This is for uh, stormwater, Jim? Yeah. Okay. And then pay vouchers we'll get to at that time, and then that's that. So, any other comments about the workshop portion? And we'll move to public comment then. Gentlemen, no. going once, going twice, all right. All right, moving on to public comment. First person to sign in is Tim Brown of Tapan. Just for those of you who haven't spoken before, it's a three minute counter. If you could try to stick to it, wrap up your sentence or so, you don't have to cut off like abruptly at three, but it ends there and then we don't go back and forth until the public comment period's op over. At the end, we then offer our responses, so uh, it's not a back and forth discussion between each uh, public commenter. So, sir, if you may, whenever okay. you're ready. Uh, Tim Brown from Tapan. I'm here to talk about Courtwood Village and how the town board is overburdening the senior citizens there. Where it's a senior complex for age 55 and older, everyone's aware of that. and. Um, after the fire in 2015, they used the money to, that they got from that fire to, lower the, to pay off the bond and buy a new bond. But in the new bond, it said they have to raise the rent for the next five years in a row. So they make an arbitrary number of $50 a year, which started in 2016. So the rent was $800, then it went to $850. So over four years, it's gone up 25%. That's unfair to a senior citizen who lives on fixed incomes. This is a senior complex. In five years, it will go, it will go up 32.1%. All right? And that's unfair to burden our senior citizens who are living there, and it's a town facility, to raise the rent that much. And according to um, after55.com, the average is around 3% a year. Yes, it could be more one year, maybe it could be less another year, but the average is 3%, not over 6% a year, which is very unfair based on the, for the initial $800. And that's what I'm here to talk about. It's just unfair to burden these senior citizens with this um, raise in rent. And over four, after the fifth year, next year is the fifth year, it will be $250 from the original base of 800. And that comes out to 31.2, oh, 31. 2% or 1%, I forget what the exact number is, but it's too high. And you're burdening these people un unfairly, not you personally, but the town board's a board that represents the town board, and they vote. And over the, after analyzing, um, according to uh, um, Rent Cafe, which is um, a public entity and stuff, that over 250 large cities across the U.S., the rent has only gone up 2.5%. But we're burdening these, our senior citizens in Orange Town, um, over 6% a year. And I think it's just unfair. And I think the town board owes everyone who lives in Court and Village a rebate or, a, or an apology or something, and both. Because what you're doing is totally unfair to these people. Their, their checks that they get every month in the mail, the Social Security and stuff, 
doesn't go up by six point something percent. It goes up by a lot less. So you are, in turn, like running these people out of there, and it's not fair. So I'm down to 10 seconds. I thank you for your time. But thank I you. just hope you can change this, because it's, it's gone up too much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll come to that at the end. Thank you. Please stick around for that. Um, Esther Baitler from Spark Hill. Good evening, Supervisor Day and town board members. My name is Esther Baitler for the record. Um, I'm very proud of what I did with Salvation Army at the Palisades Mall. I did over $3,000 with kettles. No, Dennis, I didn't make any phone calls. Um, my job coach, Bill from Juana Tech, was at my side, and he was also proud of what I accomplished. I get veterans to come and give money. And people stand there from venture as well and said, you're amazing, Esther. What would we do without you? Um, there's a new miracle that's happened on January 14th of this year. It's called The New Journey of Joy. I was asked by Debbie Archibald to help with staff training over at Venture Day Treatment. There were five people, and Debbie and I, new people coming in who want to work at Venture. And one of the girls said, where can I go? I said, it's simple, Kathy Lukens Independent Living Center. And she was just so pleased that she could come from working with a house, hands on, to the most independent living people. And I understand that I'll be doing this again. Thank you to Mr. Mazurak for making this new journey of joy. And I hope the board will come on February 11th and sit in and ask questions to our new people who are coming in. Yes, we have a lot of job openings. We have quality assurance people that we need immediately. And when I speak about venture, they say to me, boy, Esther, you're the only one who knows what's going on. Um, I will be attending the next venture board directors meeting. Now that I'm powerful for staff training, <laughs> twice a month. This is what's called the new journey of joy. And thank you to Dennis Troy for making this happen. Thank you, Esther. Is there anyone who would like to offer public comment who did not get a chance to sign in? Mr. Mandel. Or Mike is, uh, we're trying to be informal. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Good evening, uh, Supervisor Day, members of the town board, uh, Michael Mandel, the Pearl River. This is the question on the uh, Orange Town Community Center. I assume, and maybe I'm wrong, that the source of the funding would probably be bonding. Uh, I just wanted to know what's going to cost uh, per homeowner each year to pay for the bonding. Number two is uh, how many employee, new employees would be hired in order to staff and run the center. Um, and just a comment on... Uh, the presentation before us. That with the Pearl River Library, I mean, yes, Mr. Dibney was correct. Uh, last year's turnout of about 500 or so was much better than the previous years. However, it's nowhere near the 2,000 or so that show up for the school board meetings, uh, school board uh, votes. In some cases, even more than 2,000 do show up. If they happen on the same day as the school board election, number one, you're going to ensure a larger turnout of voters to participate. Uh, number two, you're going to have uh, less cost for elections. Elections are not cheap. So if you have it all at one time and you have it the same, I think Provo's uh, school uh, vote is at the high school, the library, this is well be at the same place, the same time, the same day. 
I don't see any difference that they couldn't do it at the libraries that they have over there. I think it'd be a much better checks and balances as uh, uh, Councilman Valentine put up. Uh, I don't even know when the fire district vote is in Pearl River. Well, when it is, or how many people actually vote. So I think it would be a much better thing if we, if you give them, and I think it's a great idea, consolidation. However, this might be much a better check and balance for the their expenses. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else who would like to offer public comment before we, uh, oh, no, I got the wrong, before we move to close it? All right. Seeing none, I have a motion to close public comment. Yeah. Councilman Troy, yeah. second from Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. All right. So. I'm going to toss it over to Dennis because he's got the institutional knowledge on Courtwood to hit that first for what Mr. Brown brought up. Yeah, I have the privilege of being the liaison to Courtwood Village. Sorry, Esther. I go to the monthly meetings uh, for, uh, for Courtwood Village, and I'd say out of the 98 uh, apartments that have uh, residents, maybe 15 show up at the monthly meetings. And for the last three years, we've spoken about the challenges at Courtwood Village. And I guess you gotta look at some history here. The rent was $800, all right? The problem with the rents at Courtwood Village is they were not raised enough money through the years over the previous 15 years. There were very small increases, if any increases, at you know, most of the time. The problem with Courtwood Village is it's 25 years old. As with a 25 year old building, uh, buildings, it needs new roofs, it needs uh, new gutters, it needs new drainage, it needs new sidewalks, it needs new doors, it needs new windows, it needs new boilers. That's off the top of my head. That's the ones I know are needed. Now. What happened also is the fact, if we didn't have the fire, the rents were gonna go up anyway because the, the loan that was out it was a 40-year loan and it was 25 years in and for whatever reason, whoever did the loan back 1992, whenever it was, it ended up like a balloon uh, loan where the rates were gonna go up significantly in the last 15 years. So whether we changed the bonds or not, it was still going up. And we would not have had the money to pay for roofs, boilers, etc. When the eight units burned to the ground, there was an escape clause in the initial loan. The escape clause in the initial loan, if there was a catastrophe, we could refinance. Otherwise, we couldn't refinance. It was a six and a half percent loan that we went to down to three point something. And I was uh, intricately involved in that with Walter Wedgie and Jeff, uh, Jeff Bensick of the finance department. I took a lot of work, particularly by Mr. Bensick, to get that refinanced. And the reason the refinance is you wanted long term housing for people in the town that was affordable. Now, you could debate whether $800 is affordable, 1,000 is affordable, et cetera. We've had looked at various other uh, housing units in the county. I think there's one that may be cheaper than the 1,000. If it's in Havistraw, I, I don't know. But the issue here is we had to do this in order to maintain the feasibility of that being a housing complex for the town. In order to get the bond, we had to agree to have a certain revenue stream. And the revenue stream was based on the fact we had eight less units from before, all right? And we came up with the plan of the $50 a year, and not to do it all at one time, but to go $50 a year. And I know it is a hardship, I've heard it, I've been over there every month, I listen to what people have to say, but what we are starting on is the program to put in all these new uh, changes to the uh, existing, existing units. We wanna stay in the business, but in order to stay in the business, this is what we had to do. And again, it's a thing where 
terms of really affordable housing, the only affordable housing you know in Orangetown that's less than that is Thorpe Village, and that's HUD housing, all right? And that, I know the waiting list to get into Thorpe is over a year, and that may be an option for somebody who is an existing tenant in Courtwood that they have to go over, you know, to something like Thorpe Village or go outside of the town. But in order to maintain what we have, this is the path that we're on. And I believe it's after next year, then it goes down like $30 for two or three years, and then it stops. All right, so one of the other things is once we have new roofs, boilers, et cetera, the maintenance costs, which are high for the existing facilities, should go down. Jeff, you want to add on to that? You know, Dennis is 100% uh, correct in what he said. You know, basically, Corwood Village was insolvent. Um, there had not been raises in rents for many, many years, probably at least 10 years. Uh, it was losing 50 to $100,000 a year. If not for the ability to use uh, this uh, extraordinary circumstances clauses with the fire, we would not have been able to refinance those bonds, which saved. Courtwood Village, $3.1 million over the next 25 years. That allowed um, us uh, to help Courtwood Village to be able to invest $2.5 million into all of the capital items that were needed. Now, in typical accounting, you should be having you know, any sort of a reserve fund where you are uh, putting money into reserves for these eventualities that you know you're going to need, a capital reserve fund. This was not done. Courtwood Village was insolvent, or you would have had to have $100, $200 raises immediately um, in your rent. That didn't happen. We got lucky with the uh, extraordinary uh, emergency clause that allowed us to do that. And so, but as part of that bond, you know, Courtwood Village and OHA had to come up with a plan where they were able to cover their expenses each and every year for the next five years, and that mandated uh, rent increases. Now, those rent increases should start to decrease, and uh, but if we did not do this, and if the OHA board did not do this, then there would be no OHA. So um, that's the hard truth of it. Or the rent increases would have been at least double what they were. So, just to tack on, our our position with OHA and with Courtwood in terms of legal governance and what who can say what, we appoint the board, and we guarantee their bonds. We guarantee their bonds. But then, but what? No, well, they right, I was going to say it's not a it's not the town board that votes. We don't vote on, on these things. Rent what increases. I'm saying. But the town backs up. We, we back, back up, up the, the bond. The town backs up the bond, but that was voted on by Portland Yes. Right, and we don't have the ability to make don't any decisions to, over to what they them. choose to do. We can't tell them what to do. No, but what we did is we Dennis and I, is we provided an option for them to get out of the mess that they had dug themselves in for the last 25 years. Right. But in the end, it's it, once once you guys helped figure that out for them, we had to hand it back to them and say, it, it's either handed, do it or you're in right. a lot of trouble. And then they're, they're still the ones that can make the legal decisions. We can't go in and say, now you have to do this and now you have Correct. to do that. Correct, but they are on the hook for the bond requires them to do it. So now the bond is requiring them to right. maintain a balanced book. It's not the town board. Uh, it's the bond and the SEC and the EMMA disclosures that they have to do every year for continuing disclosure uh, for that bond to remain uh, in good standing. The alternative, if we didn't go this way, would be to sell the place. And if we sold it to a private entity, all right, then they would be paying taxes on the land that's there. That's tax-free, other than the uh, sewer, uh, sewer district taxes, I believe. And the rents would end up being higher anyway. So. It's so best the, of a bad situation. Is yeah, so the, the bottom line is, you know, if you don't want more rent increases or you want to minim mitigate those, then you need to go to your OHA board meetings and you need to ask your board members to see if they can cut costs. 
Because if they can't cut costs, and, and I'm not intimately, I'm somewhat familiar with it, but I'm not intimately involved with it now, um, but that's the only way to, for them to keep their costs down. And it, it's really the OHA board members that you need to talk to and get involved with to maintain control of those rents. I tell you, being an OHA board member is a thankless task. <laughs> it is, you know, it's, it's not easy. They meet every month. They do discuss this every month. But hopefully we're moving forward now with the uh, capital uh, expenditures. No, no, but we, if you want to stick around, if you have questions, but it's not a back and forth. We don't have anything. We're offering our response, which is that legally we can't tell the OHA board what to do, period. I mean, there's just no way around that. We can't sit here and say, OHA, you, can no, long, you no longer can raise the rent on anyone. We can't. No. So, just to be clear, just to be clear, the town board, the town board doesn't manage it, and no one on this board, other than Dennis, for a small portion of that, was even on the board. The reality is that the OHA is a legally independent entity appointed by the town board. I'm, and there has been turnover, even in the time I've been here. I've been here for a year, so. The, OH, the town board now sitting here, the four and five when Jerry's here, cannot go in and say, 20 years ago, OHA made a bad call, and now you have to change your bond, you have to do this, you have to do that, cut that cost, cut this cost. We can't do that. When if someone comes up, if we feel that they mismanaged, if they were involved in a mismanagement, we cannot appoint that one person. But that's the, our, the entirety of our legal ability to do anything with them. What should happen is if the residents of Corwood Village really want something to change, they all need to go pack that room and tell the OHA board members what they want to do because we can't, once they're there, they're independent, just like the ZBA. We can't go and tell the ZBA, approve a variance because we know the guy or because we think it's a good idea. They, they, we're, it's, a, it's illegal for us to do that. We could be sued over that. So they're an independent board. We appoint them, but they're an independent board. It's the same thing with this. We just back their bonds so they get better rates, basically, it's, is what it boils down to. So. There was mismanagement well before any of our times, before Dennis's time, before certainly my and Dennis. It, it, and they were able to try to get them back on a course. And a lot of times, turnarounds hurt, whether it's in the private sector or the public sector. And the people hurting are the residents. But I mean, I mean the bottom line is Dennis was working on this years ago. You had the fire. And that was the loophole that allowed them to, to do the refinance, which allowed us to keep this entity. If, they, if that fire didn't happen, we wouldn't, I don't think we'd be owning that, that, that uh, facility anymore. Uh, they kept the, the rents artificially low. That was a board that you know, was elected. They could have gone down. They wanted to keep the rents low. You see it happen all the time. You, you, know, you see uh, back in the day, uh, Haverstraw and Stony Point, artificially kept their taxes low. They kicked it down the road 30 years. This board decided we have to deal with this. We dealt with it. We, and you know what? And I understand that it, it's now more expensive. But if we didn't deal with it, there wouldn't be a place to put people in Courtwood Village. I mean, the rents in Orangetown for one bedroom apartment, $1,700. And you know, that's not a nice apartment, let me tell you something. So we were able to do the bond. It's going to make it so that there's going to be money to do these capital improvements. It's the, it's the best out of the worst situation that can happen. And that's the bottom line. All right. And then, Paul, you have something? Or, OK. Um, Esta, great job, Salvation Army. Uh, job openings at Venture, I, I know Dennis is very intimately familiar with Venture. Obviously, being on board there, um, I, I was happy to get a tour from John Murphy a couple months ago, and the people who work there are basically saints. So if you, That's good. They're the best. <laughs> so I, if there's openings, I recommend you want to take a look. I would and mention the, that John. I would mention that. Jo I would mention that John Murphy, after 40 plus years, is the unpaid president of the Venture Board, who over 20 years ago volunteered me for the Venture Board. <laughs> I'm still on it. I'm still on it and he's off. But the, uh, he did a great job for Venture through the years with his passion, with the, his political influence. And 
he's working with the people at venture for the clients of venture. So uh, it was a job well done by John Murphy. And Esther. And Esther. How's that? Mike, to your questions about the community center, for personnel, the anticipation in terms of additional personnel is that we're going to be able to reduce one person by reallocating things within the Parks and Rec and fill, use that reduction to take the one additional person, which would be a programs manager type position. Because Parks and Rec will be co-located in that building with their offices, there is no need for full staffing of it. They basically staff it by being there, and there'd be someone to try to do more focus on making use of the space. That's the plan right now. There's no intent to hire any additional heads as a result of the community center. For funding, basically what we're at is the goal is to pay for this with land sales. We haven't executed those land sales, but my belief is that when you have a six-month design process or a five-month design process and you, can you have the money from prior land sales to afford to start that, get that going, and the, thing, the different coals that are in the fire from whether it's a cell phone tower or a, a property over here or a Rockland site property, let them proceed forward. And at some point, we either have to do a short-term financing to get to that or we have to press hold on the process because we don't feel comfortable. We can, but we'll have this done going forward responsible way. My goal is to make this a neutral thing. Um, it's not like the town hall where we have to either fix this, this town hall or build a new one and there's costs that are associated with it and we have to figure it out. This is something where we want to make sure we're paying for it responsibly and not as an additional thing. So, but we have cash left over from other previous land sales to start that process and we can move forward from there. But there's no additional heads associated with this uh, community center. All right. Moving on back to the agenda items. Do I have a motion on agenda item one to send folks to the Association of Towns training? Councilman Troy, second from Councilman Valentine, all in favor? Aye. Appointing Rosanna as our uh, delegate, and I will be the alternate, though I certainly hope that she gets to go, because I don't intend to go. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Divney, for the motion. Second from Councilman Troy, all in favor? Aye. To issue the, or to issue the contract for that design uh, to our H2M architects and engineers, do I have a motion on that one? Councilman Troy, second from Councilman Valentine, all in favor? Aye. All right. Number four, set public hearing date for the public, uh, the, for the parking at municipal lots, changes to our code. That will be on February 26th at the regularly scheduled town board meeting at 8.05 p.m. Is there a motion? Councilman Valentine, second from Councilman Troy, all in favor? Aye. Set the public hearing for the watercourse diversion permit, which will be March 12th at the regularly scheduled town board meeting at 8.05 p.m. Is there a motion? Councilman D uh, Divney, second from Councilman Troy, all in favor? Aye. Oh, you, should he not be saying the hearing, Rob? What? Just in case we should have used. All right, I'm going to recognize the motion from Councilman Valentine. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, and a second from Councilman Troy. If you could please reflect that Councilman Valentine moved it and we'll re vote. Does he have a vote? Vote uh, all in favor? Aye. And abstaining? Councilman Divney with the abstention? Three zero one, yes. Abstention. Resolution to approve sewer work certificates of registration. Motion from Councilman Troy, second from Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. Release the performance bond for Brightview Senior Living, three hundred fifty nine thousand dollars. There a motion. Councilman D Troy, second from Councilman. Can, can I have a question? Yes. I know when they built the senior complex next to Pearl River, Pearl River we, 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 le we re leased all of the bonds and then we ended up needing to put lights, street lights, because it was too dark when they came out onto the thing. Is This is all looked at by everybody, you, you know, because... Jane, the, or you or whoever would know. You, yeah. yeah, when the bond is initially set, it's set by the plan, it's recommended the amount is set by the planning board, uh, and this board sets it formally. So was everything it, checked and it met? Right. What happens is whatever they had to do, it goes through. Uh, Bruce Peters, uh, Deeney signs off, Highway signs off. Everybody reviews it to make sure that everything that they were required to do, usually it's, you know, drains and, um, you know, roads, curbs, things of that nature. Once all those things are in, they're in. I, I think what you're talking about may have been something that came after the fact, so that wasn't there, you know, that's... 
Um, yeah, I guess they found it was very dark on the corner where they entered. And right, so they, they never bonded have. for that in the first place. It's right. got to be an item that they bonded for. for it to, so that right. wouldn't this, have necessarily applied anyway. And that's right, this saying. amount is based upon, like I said, you know, sewers and okay. all, all And it was items. all checked and it's confirmed that was supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, if you look in the back of materials, there's a what we call the three signature sign-off from uh, um, engineering, highway, and sewer, and the planning board recommended relief based on that. Okay. okay. They've been issued a CO, so yeah, I, they, they had the balloons outside. I saw. So, um, all right, did we get a motion on that? That was from Dennis. Mo moved it. Paul, do you want to second it? Yeah. All right. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to authorize the rate increase for the garbage collection per the recommendations of the Sanitation Commission. Is there a motion? Please. Councilman Divney, second from Councilman Troy. All in favor? Resolution to approve an amendment to the tower lease agreement for T-Mobile. Is there a motion? Councilman DeValentine, second from Councilman Troy. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to approve a similar amendment for singular wireless at the tower. Is there a motion? Councilman Troy, second from Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to authorize and solicit bids for the recycling collection RFP. Is there a motion? Councilman Valentine, second from Councilman Troy. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to approve the MOU regarding the Rockland County Intelligence Center and the assignment of one of our police officers there. Is there a motion? Councilman Divney, second from Councilman Troy. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to authorize reimbursement for the cost of law enforcement overtime for counterterrorism training in the amount of $32,133. Is there a motion? Councilman Divney, second from Councilman Troy. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to authorize P.O. Lopez to attend the DARE officer training running from yesterday through the 25th of January. Is there a motion? Councilman Valentine, second from Councilman Troy. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to approve caretaker agreement for Nike Park at 2% increase for a term from January through December of this year. Is there a motion? Councilman Troy, second from Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Resolution to accept a memorial bench uh, in memory of Jimmy Hauberger from the Jimmy Hauberger Memorial Foundation. Is there a motion? Councilman Divney, second from Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to approve, approve cured in place pipelining at Jefferson Avenue regarding the uh, stormwater pipes. Is there a motion? Councilman Valentine, second from Councilman Troy. All in favor? Aye. All right, we have the audit now from Mr. Bensick. Okay, the audit for tonight consists of five warrants for a total of 1.6 million. First warrant had one voucher for 1,400 and was for highway school. Second warrant had 195 vouchers for 160,000 for Medicare reimbursements. The third warrant had 71 vouchers for 1.2 million and was for utilities in these items. Number one, applied golf, 50,000 for the Blue Hill contract. Number two, Capasso and Sons, 48,000 for recycling. Number four, Kathleen Dowling, for 1000 for a legal claim. Uh, number five, New York State Department of Civil Service, 774000 for CSEA health care. And then the fourth warrant had 248 vouchers for 319000 Items of interest, number one, Atlantic Salt, 76000 for highway salt purchases. Number two, Canon Solutions, 37000 for a large format scanner. And finally, the fifth warrant had one voucher for 4700 and was for a 207C claim. Any questions on the audit? Questions? No, it's good to see we're buying salt, so Jimmy's uh, highway department will be ready for any snowstorms coming up here. And hopefully we don't need it. <laughs> good. It should be at this point, right? Unless you were stealing some somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> if you had, like, rain and that's it. <laughs> so you're supposed to get something this weekend, yeah. Any other questions for Jeff? No? Is there a motion on the vouchers on the audit? Move. Councilman Divney, second Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. All right. We have one adjournment written down and two others I was informed of uh, to adjourn in memory of Thomas J. Riley, a resident of Pearl River. Um, also, Joseph Tissetta, who was a 40 plus year committee man on the, Rockland, on the Orange Town Republican Committee, and Kathleen Higgins of Thorpe Village.
Is there anyone else you want to add or reference those for adjournments that passed away recently? Okay, so in that case, I'm going to offer a motion that we move to executive session to discuss matters of land uh, sale and litigation. And was there anything else? And personnel. Uh, and then immediately thereafter adjourn in memory of Thomas J. Riley, Jof Joseph DeSetta, and Kathleen Higgins. Is there a second on that motion? Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good week.